isopropyl, ethyl, and benzyl. All three of these are alcohols, but only the ethyl alcohol is safe to drink. And the history of how and why that is is not only fascinating, but really, really long. So let's talk about it. Ethyl alcohol occurs naturally, actually, in overripe fruits that have gotten a little fermented. And the earliest evidence we have of humans ever making their own fermented alcoholic beverages is from about 11,000 BCE, where there were some grinding tools found in a cave that were probably used to make an early form of beer that was also probably gross. We also have evidence from 7,000 BCE of a rice, honey, and hawthorn berry juice drink that was made in Asia. And that was about a thousand years before we figured out making wine. Most ancient societies figured out a way to make some kind of alcoholic beverage because pretty much anything with sugar in it can be fermented into an alcoholic beverage by yeast. That being said, we did not figure out the yeast part or any of that really for a while. Most of early alcohol making was just kind of like an iterative guess and check process with recipes passed down through generations, but it was important because in a lot of cases, drinking those fermented alcohol beverages was safer than drinking the available water. Also, the whole getting drunk thing had like spiritual and social significance. As alluded to earlier, these ancient beverages were probably disgusting and also not very strong. And so to get to the spirits that we have today, we have to thank the golden age of Islam for perfecting the necessary techniques. In 800 AD or so, your boy Jabir ibn Hayyan was at it again and is credited as having been the first person to figure out that if they just added a bunch of salt to the wine as he was distilling it, the alcohol he got out or the spirit he got out would be much stronger than if he hadn't added the salt in the first place. And now I get to talk about where the name alcohol comes from because it's a wild little story. It actually comes from the Egyptians who never distilled alcohol in the first place, but they did make an eyeliner called al-khul or al-khul. I'm not perfect on my Arabic pronunciation. Please don't at me. But this eyeliner they would make by grinding up charcoal with galena, which is lead ore and stibonite. Not very good for you, but they would grind them together, heat them up. And once you heat them, they release this black sooty material that they would collect on a surface held above it and scrape that off. And there they got their eyeliner. But importantly, it was the spirit of what came out of these mineral mix. That was the al -hul. Fast forward to the Arabs and the golden age of Islam, they kind of borrowed the term al -hul from the Egyptians and used it to mean basically anything that came out of a distillation. Side note, doesn't mean body eating spirit, it just means spirit, all right? But that's also where spirits come from. So initially, alcohol was alcohol of wine or spirit of wine. Incidentally, there was also an alcohol of vitriol or spirit of vitriol, sulfuric acid. That was a thing, but it came later, much later. The ability to make pure alcohol continued to improve such that by the 12th century, we were able to make 90% ethanol solutions relatively easily. This highly rectified spirit, this very pure alcohol was prized for its use as an anesthetic, you know, from alcohol poisoning basically, and also for pain relief, which dubious perhaps, but then you mix it with the right herbs and yeah, it'll cure whatever you want, right? This medical use helped spread the technique more broadly throughout the world over the course of the 12 to 1500s, when chemistry itself wasn't really a full science yet. And that's how we started getting those spirits that we're familiar with now, like whiskey and mezcal and brandy. Eventually, after we formally figured out rum, gin, and tequila as well, studying the science of fermentation became part of Marie Anne and Antoine Lavoisier's quest to turn chemistry into an actual science. And among the many contributions that they made, including naming some of the elements that we now recognize, was determining that this rectified spirit was comprised of carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen. They did this in part by performing what are called combustion experiments, where you take something and you burn it and very, very carefully measure everything that comes out of that process. And by doing this, you can figure out what that something was made out of, which was a big deal. We, we didn't know that at that point. We didn't even know that oxygen was an element really at that point. We owe a lot to the Lavoisiers. And unfortunately, Antoine Lavoisier was killed during the French Revolution in 1794. However, Mary Ann Lavoisier did a whole lot of work to make sure that the work that they did together survived for the future generations of scientists. Two years after his death, a German-Russian chemist was able to, for the first time though, isolate actual pure ethanol. Although it wasn't called that yet. It wasn't ethanol yet. It was just the most rectified spirit you could ever rectify. Getting ethanol to this level of purity is in general kind of hard to do. 
because there's this thing called the water ethanol azeotrope, which is just a fast way of saying that if you boil a mixture of the two, the vapors that come off are always gonna be a mixture of the two up to a certain point. So if you have 95% ethanol and you're trying to get that last 5% of water out and you distill it, at least 5% of the water vapor you get off of the mixture is gonna be water. So from the beginning to the end, you're just transferring that 95% ethanol from one flask to another, unless you finesse it. And Johan Tobias Lowe's managed to do it pretty much the same way that Jabir ibn Hayyan had done it, where he just added a bunch of salt to the distillation. But he took it a step further. Instead of just starting with wine, he started with the most rectified spirits you could get to begin with. Therefore, there wasn't a lot of water to remove. So the salt that he added held on to that last 10% of so water, and he got the gold, the actual spirit ethanol, but it wasn't ethanol yet. It wasn't ethanol yet. Before we could get to that, we had to figure out the actual formula. And that took another 20 years where this other chemist, Nicholas Theodore de Sauser, is the person who is credited with actually figuring out the chemical formula for ethanol, which he also did using combustion experiments. But if you really want to do that correctly, you need really pure ethanol, which he couldn't have gotten if it weren't for Lowe's. And it was 50 years after that first formula got published that the structure of ethanol got figured out. And that we owe to a different chemist, Archibald Scott Cooper. We also owe a straight evolution in chemistry for that, because in order to understand the structure of a molecule, you kind of got to know how the atoms want to attach to each other. And we didn't figure that out until about 1850, when chemists were just starting to accept the concept of valency that certain elements only want to make a certain number of bonds with other atoms. But once you know that, and you know the chemical formula, how many atoms of each element there are, then it's kind of like just putting together a puzzle. If you know that oxygen needs to make two bonds, carbon needs to make four bonds, and hydrogen has to make one bond, there's only so many ways that you can arrange two carbons, six hydrogens, and one oxygen, and actually satisfy those rules. But now that we kind of had this understanding of structure, well, you know, chemists were like, yeah, we go into town. And over the next 40 or so years, we started deciphering the structures of a whole bunch of other molecules. And then chemists were like, well, wait a minute, there's wood spirits and that's also kind of an alcohol. And then there's these other alcohols called fusel alcohols that come out of this whole fermentation process. This is starting to get a little confusing. And at that point, the top chemists in Europe got together and we were like, all right, look, peep it. If it's got one of these OH situations in the structure, it's an alcohol. That's, that's just what we're going to do. And since we've been calling two carbon chunks F for a while now, and that's the one that we can drink, it's ethyl alcohol now. That's, that's that one. And that's just kind of how it went. But that, that was for the nerds, right? That was for the geeky chemists who went to this 1892 convention on chemical nomenclature, where we set up the Geneva rules, the precursor to IUPAC rules. For everybody else, alcohol was alcohol. You know what I mean? Spirits were spirits. And this distinction became a little more important. You know, strong spirits were now more available as chemistry was being applied more directly to the brewing and distilling process. And drinks were starting to taste better just kind of across the board. But for as long as there has been drinking, there have been drinking problems. And access to strong drink like this was a mixed bag. The US is not the only country in history to ever have tried to implement some kind of prohibition measure, but they definitely are pretty famous for doing a pretty terrible job of it. For a variety of socio and political reasons, the U.S. enacted the 18th Amendment to its Constitution, which made the sale, manufacture, and transportation of alcohol and alcoholic beverages illegal in most circumstances. And uh, yeah, most people weren't down for that, actually. Almost overnight, the illicit sale of alcohol blossomed. These secret bars called speakeasies started springing up in cities. They were getting their alcohol from bootleggers who had connections to illegal distilleries. These illegal distilleries, often in rural areas, were just out there selling alcohol to the people around them. And a lot of times they weren't like fermenting their own grain or anything. They were taking industrial alcohol sources and trying to distill and purify that. And an attempt to combat this led to the US government making one of its most ghastly blunders of recent history, where they began pushing chemical companies to not only further denature their alcohol, but denature it with really bad, really terrible things for people to drink, hoping that bootleggers would stop then using this as a feedstock because people would get sick or people would stop drinking it because they were getting sick. But you know, that's not what happened. Thousands of people 
lost their lives, and untold numbers more went blind and got very, very sick from the methanol and benzene that were getting pumped into these alcohols. The use of methanol was particularly ghoulish because it's difficult to separate from ethanol. Methanol is also kind of immediately harmful to you, and unlike benzene, there's no real way that you can tell that the alcohol you're drinking has methanol in it. With the benzene, you might at least smell it. That's what makes it so bad to use methanol. You don't know that you drank it until you're like going blind which isn't actually because of methanol, it's because of what your body does to try and get rid of methanol and other things. In the case of methanol and ethanol, we have this enzyme, alcohol dehydrogenase, that turns methanol into formaldehyde and ethanol into acetaldehyde both of which are not good to have in your body. Thankfully, we have aldehyde dehydrogenase as well, and that takes the acetaldehyde, turns it into acetic acid, takes the formaldehyde, turns it into formic acid. Acetic acid is basically vinegar. Not a big deal for the body. Formic acid, whole other story. Don't want that kicking around in your system either. The formaldehyde and the formic acid are what make methanol actually bad for you to drink. They are what lead to the hallucinations and the blindness and the eventual death from drinking relatively small amounts of methanol. If you can stop your body from processing the methanol, either with like ethanol or fomepazole, this other drug, your body will eventually just flush out the methanol. But by that point, you might also need your blood filter because you probably already got formic acid kicking around in your system. Thankfully, the US eventually repealed prohibition because it was wildly unpopular and people were able to go back to enjoying liquor from the liquor store that wasn't tainted with methanol. To be clear, ethanol is not necessarily that good for you either. But in small, responsible amounts, it's actually really helpful for like, you know, social cohesion. It makes people friendly, it makes people chatty, but it also makes it a little easier for you to get taken advantage of and it makes it harder for people to make judgment calls. So, you know, drink responsibly. Like I'm going to in a few minutes, I'm gonna go grab me a glass of scotch. Thank you to the Highland Scots who figured out that beverage and thank you to you for watching to the end. If you like this one, feel free to hit that like button. And if you wanna support what I'm doing, definitely consider hitting me up on Patreon or Kofi. But until next time, Skim Thugs.